my name is Ralph. I'm going to present a kind of evening and night project of mine to you, which uh, we call All Mogo. Um, we're trying to design a something like a cryptographically secure social network that can also be used as a private data storage, that can be used as a chat system, and that's designed for long-term archiving. Um, if, there's an, if there are any questions, please don't, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to do a demo in the presentation. I can show you some of the prototypes that we have um, after, the, after the presentation, but um, I didn't feel it was, it was right to show it here on stage already. So who, who is Olmogo? Um, it's basically a friend of mine and me. The right one's me. Um, Ali uh, is an entrepreneur who sold his first software company end of the 90s, and um, that was in, in he, he, he was actually designing a hospital information system. So he was handling clinical information and uh, sold that to a number of uh, hospitals, and then sold his company um, and has now other projects on his agenda. And I'm in my uh, public life, I'm a um, I lead a team of embedded software engineers in one of the large companies, but when the kids are in bed, I'm trying to work on that project. Additionally, we have uh, a few designers and, and programmers with us that, that help us implementing everything, but as I said, it's in an early stage. So what do we aim at with Olmogo? One thing that's on our agenda is to really put back the um, the users in control of their data. Um, I don't know if you've been at the Privacy International talk. I, I've seen the speaker here, I think, in the, in the, in the audience, actually. Um, that was a very interesting talk about how companies exploit your data. Um, we would like to provide a platform where you can actually see what kind of data is visible by whom. So that's, that's actually the second point. Um, provide a system where everybody can opt in or opt out in the usage of personalized data um, and offer transparent feedback um, on who can see what kind of data. Um, and that brings me to the other point. It's, I don't think it, it makes total sense to keep everything in private, but the border between private life and public life should be clearly delineated. So if I don't care in a certain circumstance about other people seeing my data or using my data, that's fine. It's just about me knowing who is going to be um, acting on, on my data. Um, should be user-friendly, should have open interfaces to make the access to data and the administration of access rights easy. Um, one of the business aspects of it is that we, that we want to offer companies a way of storing personalized data in accordance with uh, the upcoming legislation. That means we're trying to store personalized data as your data. So if a company, we, we offer an interface that if a company acquires data that's personally belonging to you according to the legislation, it will be stored as your data and you can ultimately control who has access. The company can give itself access to it while storing it, but you can withdraw at any time the access to that data set. And to provide a universal distributed data storage system um, with maximum security and resilience to attacks. So what would interest me in the end is if the ideas I'm going to present you um, if, if you think these ideas are valid, um, and if, if, if you have s maybe some, some opinion on, on what we're doing. So let me introduce a little bit the problem setting. I guess that's clear to everybody here, but I still would like to elaborate a little bit more on what we think the problem is. So first problem, do we actually have control over our digital self? And I'm not talking about the data that maybe your car collects while you're driving, but actually the data you think you're in control of. So that's me. And if I want to share something, pictures, anything, texts, messages with my friends, then personally, even as a technical expert, I would think, okay, the data, I, I send it to somebody, so this somebody should be able to see it. But usually, I, th I think most people don't really recognize that the data is also seen by others, especially by the infrastructure that you're using. So obviously, if you share some images via some system like Facebook or even by email or anything, 
The infrastructure is a vital part of it, and most people that are not so technically deep into the topic um, don't recognize that. That's, that's one of the problems. The, to solve that, there's a very simple prerequisite, which would be that if you share your data with somebody, you put trust in that person. And that's okay. You trust persons because you know them or you think they are, they are friends and they can misuse that trust or they can fulfill that trust. That is something that we have been in the evolution be, be um, like willing to learn how to cope with that. But the, the problem is that the infrastructure, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be forced to trust the infrastructure. The infrastructure should actually prove that it's, that it's secure. And one very simple thing to do, of course, is in this case complete client-side encryption. If you send an encrypted email, it doesn't matter what the infrastructure does with it, it will just be visible by the recipient, at least if you can, um, if you can trust the cryptographic algorithms. Other measures would be possible. You could also scramble your data in some way or, or um, make small packages of large data sets if you even worry about the fact that the size of the data could reveal something about the content of the data. Um, apparently, client-side encryption is something very simple to do, but it's something seldomly done in, in, in large-scale systems. For example, these, these are the um, top 10 security risks in cloud computing, as determined by a study from the European, the European Network and Information uh, Security Agency, um, which you can download from their, from their page, actually, the, re the report. And of these top 10 um, issues in cloud computing, which is uh, loss of governance because the service providers in, in, in charge of the security um, lock in because you use proprietary systems that you can't, uh, where you can't move your data freely around, isolation failure that some other people can actually look at your data, and things like that. Of all these 10 issues, at least these four that I marked in orange are the ones that can be completely solved by client-side encryption. While the other four that I marked are um, significantly reduced just if you do encryption on the client side, which is uh, actually a very simple thing to do, in my opinion. Um, just keep this, this, this in mind. The other thing that normal users struggle with, um, and I occasionally struggle with, is if you do client side encryption, and let's say you use GPG or any kind of uh, encryption system for your emailing, um, it's still complicated. I mean, definitely you have to use a passphrase for your private key. That's, that's obvious because otherwise the private key will be uh, very, very vulnerable. If you use the passphrase, um, well, I have forgotten mine quite a few times. Um, I don't know how you cope with it. Some people write it down. It's not actually the best thing to do, right? The other thing is that many people use a key that's valid for an indefinite amount of time. That's also not something, um, something um, reasonable to do. Uh, key renewal and key revocation should be an essential part of the system. These systems support it. But in fact, I don't think many people have been using it. And then, if, if you implement a cryptographic system, of course, there's all these cryptographic pitfalls that you might step in where you have things that you didn't consider or that might not have been um, publicly known at the time when you designed the system, which is, should you use authenticated encryption? I guess everybody uses authenticated encryption nowadays, although um, GPG does an individual signature afterwards. Um, you should also not, you, you should also if possible, not use a single, single key pair for signing and encryption because you might be um, vulnerable to some kind of oracle attacks and all these things that the, the end user shouldn't actually be worrying about. So one thing we, we try to do, we try to think, is there an alternative to passphrases, especially if you want to distribute your private key among many devices um, and you want to still keep it safe on many devices and if you want to be able to employ an infrastructure to actually exchange it um, between these devices and an infrastructure other than copying it on a USB stick and doing it yourself. Um, one of the ideas that we, that we followed is well, you could still you, you could split up the information in, in your key in two parts by using, if you have it available, 
a cryptographically secure random number sequence. Um, if you would XOR that, you would get basically two, two sequences. One is the original um, sequence of random numbers. The other one is just the private key XORed by these random numbers. If the random number sequence is unique and is cryptographically secure, then of course um, you, you destroyed the information in each single part of these, these, these um, results there. So you could share one part um, safely if the other part is not known. So if you keep one part on your system and you send out the other one um, to an infrastructure that keeps track of it, um, that could help in reducing uh, the, the passphrase problem because the second system could then do some kind of authentication against the password or passphrase of yours and if you actually lose that you would still be able to recover the key. I know there are other mechanisms of, of key recovery if, if you shared the key or if you shared information about the key between, between many persons um, but that's not the approach we, we would like to take. And of course if, if you're designing a client for the, the average user then the client system should, should take care of all the complicated things like um, renew intervals, keeping track of your old keys to be able to restore the old encrypted information, um, and also use every now and then uh, modified algorithms with different key lengths, with updated uh, block lengths, and, and, and so on. Um, another, another problem that most people, I don't think, are not aware of is um, that encryption alone doesn't suffice to take uh, control of your, your private data. Let's assume I've taken an image, um, and I would like to share that. What, what, what do I normally do? Maybe I send it by email to a friend of mine. Maybe I send it via chat system. Maybe I publish it even on a social network if I think that that image can be seen by everybody. I don't care if, if uh, Facebook runs its algorithms against that image. I can be free to share it. And then maybe I didn't switch off the, the iCloud synchronization and it's even, it's, it's even copied to another server. The, the problem with that is um, normally I would, would like, if, if this is happening singularly, I would maybe remember, okay, with whom I shared that information. But normally I would say that people are not really in control because the data they're actually sharing is copied arbitrarily. If you send an email, it's copied as an attachment. <clears throat> if, you, if you send it by the chat system, it's copied into the chat system, it's copied to iCloud, it's copied everywhere because it's digital information and copying is cheap. Um, so once you send it out, actually that access has been granted. You have no real record of the fact that you granted somebody access to that image, to that particular image. You cannot withdraw that access right because that information has already been sent to somebody else. Um, and so I, I, would, I would call it that the process of sharing is actually completely out of control because we arbitrarily copy data. When I think about life in, my, um, in, my, uh, in, in the business I'm, I'm doing during daytime, then it's, it's the same thing. People copy things on network drives. They copy it in different versions. Then they send it via email. They put it on a cloud system and so on and so forth. And nobody actually has track of where this information is being distributed. So my opinion is that if you want to properly um, bring data governance back to the owner of these data sets, you, you would have to, first of all, design a system where you can grant and withdraw access rights. Of course, that, that's clear. If somebody has read access to your data, this person is free to, to, to download your data and then distribute it again. It might not be legal if it's a company, but of course you cannot prevent somebody from doing that. But you could at least archive the fact that you gave somebody access. And if that person hasn't accessed it yet, withdrawing the access would also suffice to make sure the data is not being distributed out of your control. Um, the second point is all these access rights with whom you shared information, they need to be made transparent to the owner of the data, which is you. If you want to achieve that, then the access rights, they should be connected to the data object and the data object needs to be a singularity. It shouldn't be copied. There should be a unique ID describing that data object, a unique 
URL actually, and you shouldn't share it by, I, I call it sharing by value, you should share it by reference. Actually, you should just share that document URL. There's a number of, 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 of systems out there, let's state, for example, Mega, that provides something like that. They provide a cloud storage system, which is client-side encrypted, and you can share URLs to the, to the, to the data stored in there. Um, still, uh, the, the system I'm describing here is a little bit different in that it's not only designed to share large, large data objects. Um, and th the last point I already mentioned, with the withdrawal of access rights, data obviously will not be deleted by anybody who copied it, but it might state the fact that usage of this data from that point on might be illegal, which might be um, an advantage if, if you're talking about data uh, that was provided by, by um, a, a company or used by a company. Um, that brings me to something that has been mentioned all over the conference um, as well, the uh, new legislation that will be active from May next year, I think, um, the European General Data Protection Rules, as opposed to the US where um, the equivalence of these rules, I think, had been um, cancelled by the Trump administration. In Europe, this will, this will become, the, become law. First thing is a right to be forgotten. You, you have the right, if, if this is data that's personally assigned to you, you have the right to request its deletion. Um, you, should, you, you also have the right to request your data from a company in a, in a readable format, so not just the binaries. Actually, it's stated that you should be able to get it in a human readable form. This is the, the right to data portability that's mentioned here on the slide. Um, systems should be designed that they protect data by design and by default. There should be no hidden secret trap doors that you, that you have to enable in order to, to, to secure data. They should be, as a default setting, uh, be active. And um, actually there will be I don't know if in practice, but in theory, high fines will be that will be assigned to um, companies that not that not um, that do not comply to these rules. So that can be up to four percent of their annual turnover, which is, I think, a significant amount. So again, um, before I, I I get into the system uh, in more detail, our vision would be that there is an open platform for all of your data where. Um, data, maybe even from your car, is just not going to a company server, but it's actually going to 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 the system um, that we call Allmogo, which should be an open platform. Um, it should be independent of its source. If you have a variable, it shouldn't send the data to the company that produced the variable. It should actually send the data to you or to a system where you can administer this data. Um, this platform should should allow you to share and also withdraw. Um, the rights to, to, for somebody else to read it so that you can regain uh, the power over your data. Um, it should provide an owner URL for each data element, may it be just a GPS location from your GPS tracker, may it be an email, may it be an image or a complete movie. Um, and the system should be designed, again, um, with high security and high resilience against the text. I'm not speaking about DDoS or something like that, which is clear um, that you should have some resilience against it, but really a system where an attacker would have to gain control over most parts of the system to actually gain uh, useful information. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the, the, the concepts that we designed into the system. One core concept is what we call MOGOs. Or MOGO is an um, artificial word, but we, we, we like the idea about each data man being called a MOGO and living in the, in the all MOGO. Um, so an encrypted data entity, may it be small or large, is called MOGO. And it can be, as I said, a picture or document. It could be a small comment on somebody else's MOGO, which would then actually comprise a, a chat or some kind of feedback system, as you know it from, from social networks. It could be personalized da data of the user in his role as owner or in her role of, as owner that was created by a third party. For example, as I said, GPS tracking or the like. Um, 
or it could just be an empty container where you like to collect other MOGOs in there. Each MOGO has a unique URL called the MOGO ID. Um, MOGOs are invariant, um, and they're encrypted using the standard hybrid encryption scheme. Um, why are they invariant? Think about a system where you would actually like to share your personal data, share it with companies, maybe to get, gain some benefits or anything else. If you want to have somebody relying on the data that you store there, you shouldn't be able to change it. Um, you should be able to delete it, you should be able to store it, you should be able to deliver a new version, but a single version at a single point in time should be immutable invariant. Um, and the general structure would be that MOGOs can link to other MOGOs. Um, you, you could call that child MOGOs, but actually it's not building a hierarchy, it's just a directed, a directed graph which potentially is cyclic. So you have MOGOs that link to other MOGOs. And actually the, the process of today's um, sending around data would just be the process of sharing this MOGO with somebody, the process of commenting or sending a video reply or posting a comment on a social network site, that would just map to a new link from one MOGO to another MOGO. Um, as is the case with hybrid encryption, with, with standard hybrid encryption schemes, um, and not, not, I'm not speaking about m those multi-user um, public-private key systems where you actually just need um, a, a single key for encryption, but I'm talking about the standard hybrid encryption schemes. Um, each user that may access a MOGO, which is encrypted, of course, needs its own version of the encrypted symmetric key that was used for the hybrid encryption. And that's the point I mentioned. The space where all MOGOs live is called all MOGO. All right. Um, why do we think this is kind of a um, novel idea or a novel aspect to what, what is out there on the market? Um, I think the novelty is if you, if you think about data just being connected as a directed graph, you can map many of the current applications to this kind of data structure. A private um, a, a file system that you store in, in a private network storage. A file system is a hierarchy. A hierarchy is a subset of a directed graph. Um, so you can map the file system to Olmogo. You can just store the complete file system to Olmogo. But then um, you, you can also make sure that only you have access to that. So that would be your private cloud, if you, if you may. A private data storage consists of MOGOs only accessible by one user. That's you. Um, if you want to share it, you can just um, append the number of, 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 of encrypted keys for other users. And only those who have a key, of course, can access the data. Um, if you think about a chat system, a chat system in the standard WhatsApp or Messenger case, it's just one message after the other. That could be a parent MOGO and just different child MOGOs underneath that. Um, so in the, in the prototype system that we have as an app, you just choose how to, how to display, for example, such a MOGO hierarchy. If you say, ah, this is a chat, then you just tell the system to, to display it in the typical chat form. If you, if you say it's not, it's not a chat, it's actually a gallery of images that I created, then it should be displayed as a gallery of images. Doesn't, doesn't matter for the application, it's just how you want to look at it. If you think about a chat in the Reddit sense, where you can actually comment on comments and then a comment on comments further up in the hierarchy, that can also be um, realized with that kind of linkage. Um, and if you think about social network, there you normally post something and people give their feedback. That's also easy to store in that kind of system. And when you think about designing a user interface for that. I know I'm not going to show it here in the presentation. I'm happy to share the ideas of the user interface with you after the talk, because actually the user interface is currently not connected to the cryptographically secure core of Almogo. It's just connected to a test server just to see how we can, how we can um, realize the user interactions. The user interactions are very simple. You want to share, withdraw shares, or link MOGOs to other links, and you can actually um, fulfill all these, these use cases. Uh, that I that I shown on this slide. So you just need to slide your MOGO on your app to to a person, and it'll be shared with that person. You can just 
um, remove a person from a MOGO and it will not be shared any longer with that person. So that's a very, very easy, very easy interaction system. Okay. Uh, let's talk a bit about the programmatic um, structure. I know it might not be readable that well, but I'm, I'm going through it. So what are the components of that system? So that's the person, of course, who knows but may also occasionally forget his or her uh, passphrase. Um, and this person is allowed to access parts of the Elmogo, the, the parts where he actually has, or she has, in this case it's me, um, has the, the appropriate, appropriate rights. Then you have the different user, uh, user device, devices, end user devices. Um, you can store a device dependent version of the private key. We, we, I've, I've shown this um, method of splitting the private key into several parts. You could do that individually for each device that you have. It would still resemble the same private key, but if somebody steals the device and tries to um, reconstruct the private key, you could explicitly in the system withdraw the access rights for that single device that you have here. So it stores a device dependent version or part of the private key. It may also contain um, a cache of uh, downloaded MOGOs for um, performance reasons. And then you have three types of servers that don't have to be hosted by, by us. They could be hosted by anybody. Um, one is the actual authorization server where all the profiles and um, second parts of the keys are stored. Um, this one is responsible for authentication of the user because the, um, as I said, if you split the private key and distribute it over the network infrastructure, you can't um, use that private key to actually certify or authenticate against the system. So you need to do another authentication process. Um, we have the, the indexing server, which is the directory structure where all the links are stored. The actual data content is not being stored, but the index server contains all the URLs for all the MOGOs. And if you want to access the actual data set, um, you get a small, small file from the index server that just tells you from which of the storage servers you need to recover what part of, of the file. So we also additionally split a file in several packets, distribute these packets over different, different um, storage servers, and even use a different ID on the storage service. So you'll have a, you'll have a certificate for, all, uh, for each storage server that you're actually accessing. That certificate is not linked to your actual identity. So in the end, if somebody gets control over the, over the storage server, that person will not be able to reconstruct what kind of data you actually own there and would not be able to derive from the amount of data or, the, or any kind of metadata or the, the size of individual files, what types these files actually contain. Um, so on the index server, you'll reference a MOGO using a URL that's composed of the index server name and a UUID for the MOGO, nothing more. And um, what is stored with each MOGO is a timestamp, so they can actually order them in, in consecutive order, and the ownership is marked inside. What's possible is that you store additional meta metadata, but we're not quite sure about how far we go. So if you put a file name in there, that would be vulnerable, I guess. Yeah, but if you if you think it's 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 not a problem, you you could add this. So we have um, additional metadata support, um, if needed. Um, especially with file names, you would ha have to you you would like to sort after the file name as well. So then it needs to be indexed on the database for retrieval, and that makes it so it's pretty much open. Then, if if you open that kind of metadata to 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 the server, if somebody would gain control of that server, these names would be visible. They would not be transferred necessarily, but they would be visible on the server. So, so one point that we also try to make is we, we try to design a system where the provider of the services doesn't know doesn't know anything about the data being stored. Um, if you store file names, it, it's an issue we're internally discussing, actually. OK, the authentication protocol, uh, just a quick uh, wrap up. That's a variant, a simplified variant of Kerberos, um, where you send an encrypted authentication request that contains your username and password, which is encrypted 
by a key um, that you know from the so basically with the certificate you got from the authentication server of course that's not safe that's only safe if you pin uh, the root certificate for your infrastructure otherwise you'd be uh, probably experiencing man in the middle attacks um, uh, what you get as a response is the second part of your private key in clear text and then an encrypted session key encrypted with your um, public certificate and an encrypted session certificate that states all the identities under which you're known to the indexing server. So the indexing server also doesn't know your username, it just knows a number of identities that own a number of MOGOs and from the authentication server you just get a certificate stating which identities you are allowed to see. Okay, um, so that's another point um, that I'll quickly mention. The authentication server knows, your, knows and uses your username. It maps that username to a number of identities, um, and different identities can be used for different purposes. If you think the information is not so, ne doesn't have to be so secure, and you'd actually like to share with a whole bunch of people, you could also think about giving a number of people the same private public key pair, um, which reduces uh, cryptographic um, security quite a bit, but if it's a trustworthy group, then might be a possibility. You still have device and person independent um, or person dependent um, private key parts because you split it in different ways using different one-time pads. Um, the indexing server just uses the identities that have been given by the authentication server. It doesn't really have to verify that you're allowed to access um, MOGOs. It needs to verify that you're allowed to store new MOGOs or that, you, that you're allowed to delete MOGOs, but the actual content is still encrypted. So even if you gain access to the indexing server, you wouldn't be able to read out information. And last not least, the storage server uses, again, other identities. The idea behind that is, um, the storage will actually create most of the, 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 the cost in the system because that's the actual data being stored. So what we're thinking about is handing out um, like one-time tickets. So for example, um, I request an identity, a certificate for let's say 50 terabytes. Over 10 years, I pay that in a single sum and for 10 years that amount of data will be stored there. And if I don't extend that contract, it'll just be deleted. Nobody can use it anyways. And with these, with these um, identities, I just, I just mark my right to store data on the storage server. I don't give any connection to who actually stored data there and um, what kind of data is that. So the storage server doesn't know to which MOGOs this data actually belongs. Um, yeah, that's just the storage protocol. I, I think um, I, I already explained it. So in the beginning, you, you authenticate against the authentication server. If you want to store, for example, a larger file such as a movie, you would, you would um, split that in different parts. That could potentially go to different um, storage server using different storage identities. Um, and you would authenticate yourself against a storage server using your storage identity, you would store the data packets, you would receive a URL, how you can uh, retrieve the data from the storage server. That URL is actually not protected, so anybody could read that URL, although it doesn't contain um, useful data because everything is encrypted. And then you would authenticate against the index server and tell the index server, okay, here's a new MOGO, it's distributed on that in that URL. Um, and this information, where the data is actually being distributed, that's also encrypted. So the indexing server doesn't know anything about where the data is stored in the end. Um, you can spread data over several storage servers. These servers do not have to be hosted by us. Um, you could store them, you could store your data on your private infrastructure if you want. Um, you would just have to um, open up a port on, on one of your servers and, and let the, the client software do, do the rest for you and accept packets from, from, from uh, your identity. Um, we, we have a strict separation between the structure of your data, so um, who are you connected with, um, how are the MOGOs linked to each other, and what kind of data is actually stored in them. Um, and these servers operate, as I said, independent of each other. Um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, resilience to attacks in such a system. Um, if we assume the encryption is state of the art, and we can actually 
because we're not using a fixed encryption algorithm um, that's, that's all configurable and changeable over time, um, assuming that the encryption is state-of-the-art, then if somebody has total control of one of these servers, this person could obviously always harm you in a sense that this person could delete data on a server. You could, if you have physical access to the server, you could just demolish it. <laughs> if you have virtual access to the server, you could still delete hard drives or anything. <laughs> but the adversary will not be able to, to um, decrypt any of your data stored in there. Um, if an adversary has control of a, total control over one of the servers, this adversary will not, will not be able to decrypt. Um, it will not harm your security or privacy. It will harm the safety of your data. Um, accidental exposition of memory data, which is uh, probably one of the most common um, security leakages. Um, if, if that happens, um, you would have to have, first of all, the, the key stored on the end user device, and then by accident, a um, basically um, the memory data of the other part of the encrypted key and you would have to know that these belong together. If this is the case, you could restore the private key and then you could probably, if you also know the, the password of the user, you could authenticate against, against the system. Um, if an end user device is being stolen, you could just um, disallow access and you could delete the second part of the private key and so the, the part stored on the device would be rendered useless. Um, and if somebody controls the indexing and the authentication and the storage server, not the authentication server, um, that would be considered uncritical. Yeah? But end user device and authentication server, that would uh, render the system um, vulnerable uh, that's a point where we are working on, but it's clear one, one part of the system needs to be controlled a little bit better than the others. Another concept uh, before I, um, I wrap up the presentation, another concept that we have is the concept of agents. So assume what I talked about now is sharing data with persons, but sometimes you want to share data with the system, maybe a company or maybe a system that actually provides, for example, full text indexing for your documents. If you want to do a full text search and still a safe full text search, you would require to have an index and this indexing process might take too long to be executed on your end user device. And that's why we introduced the concept of agents, which are technical users, that can get access to your data if you share your data with them. Um, what you could do with that, if you still want to keep your old um, Facebook accounts and you would still would like to post occasionally on Facebook, but you have data stored in Olmogo, what you could do is you just set up a uh, Facebook agent that uses the Graph API to publish data in your name and you could actually share one of your mogos with that agent, this agent would publish it if you want, and you would still see that there is information that you shared with Facebook. So if you have all of your images in the system in, in Olmogo, you could do a search um, with whom did, did I share any, anything with this kind of, of social, social network, and you would get an answer to that question. And I think with the Graph API, it should also be possible to even delete a post if you withdraw the access to the agent. So that could be, to be synchronized. Not all of the um, social network or messaging systems support that, but at least posting should not be a problem. And keeping like, the information in one place, seeing with whom did you share that information, that would still, that would still be possible. OK, some, some details on the implementation. Um, what we've written up to now is written in Scala, which is my favorite language. Um, although coming from the embedded world, uh, I like to code uh, functionally in my private time. Um, we're using, for all the communication infrastructure, we're using Akka. Um, and for database access, we're using Slick. Uh, the encryption is provided by the standard Java cryptography architecture, which gives rise to a number of pitfalls. I know that. Um, but we, we created our own wrappers to allow um, 
proper initialization and, and, and things like that. Uh, the web protocols for the client, they're based on uh, the JSON web signature and web encryption protocols. Um, and the client software is available as a, as a jar that you could, that you could use to access. Um, the the backend service and the client lib are pretty much uh, in an alpha version. Uh, if anybody's interested, I can share information information on that. The app is under development. I actually wanted to present you the app, but um, unfortunately, uh, our app developer's wife just uh, got her baby a few weeks too early, and he didn't have time to finish it um, in time for for the conference here. Um, and we just started developing uh, agents for Facebook and, and also incoming mails that could be stored in Olmogo as well. Um, so there's more to come by the end of October, hopefully. Um, if, if you like the ideas that, that I presented, um, then just, just, just contact me. We're happy to, to, um, to have others uh, joining us. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to your questions, if there's any. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yes, please. Is the system fully open source? Um, so the question was, is the system fully open source? Um, right now, it's not. Will it be? Um, we're not sure if it will be. Um, my idea would be to share it at some point when we are more confident on, on how, how the things work, um, especially because we would like to have that system for the average user available and, 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 and spread. Um, but I still need to discuss that issue with my business partner. Yes. Um, is the company for profit or non profit? The company, um, as um, founded uh, last week, actually, is a profit company. It aims at providing these services for companies as well. So we, what we would like to have is a system that's free of charge to use for everybody. Um, but we'd also like to distribute that system inside companies to do um, like their internal data exchange. Because I think there's a lot of things um, uh, going on in the industry that are, that are um, actually wrong like sharing data over network drives, copying it via email, and so on. That's, that's what, I, what I discovered in my daily life. And that's something we'd like to um, exploit, if you may, so if you want to say so. Further questions? Yes, please. We would not use it if it's not open source. If it's OK, if it's for profit, then you make That's not a problem. That's okay. So the, the the point was that how can you trust us if it's not open source? And um, I I fully agree uh, with that uh, with that point, actually. Um, so what we'd like to, if if there's if there's an interest in the community, um, I would like to give out parts of it by now, um, and when the time is right, I would like to open it up. Because I, I, I fully understand that that's a valid point. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. How do you, uh, like Facebook makes money off my, off my information that I feed it, that Google doesn't take? How would you make money? Okay, so the question is how would that mo uh, company make money? Um, and the, the one answer I already gave was we, we are trying to, to um, aim at the. Uh, business area, selling it as an own infrastructure to businesses. Um, the other way of making money would only be possible, I think, by selling storage space. So if, if, you, look at the, if you look at Mega, for example, um, which is, I guess, also not open source, uh, they charge quite a significant amount of money for storing data on their servers. And ultimately, that would probably be the case. What I can imagine is that if you share it with companies, and companies actually currently make money with your data, that this, um, this money is then given back to you. Because in this system, you could be following um, the usage of data for different purposes. If you, you give data, you hand out your data to a company, why not gaining something from it? And may just be that the storage is, is for free then. <laughs> Yes, please. Yeah. Is there a way to store data uh, on my own server? Uh, 
Okay, so the question is, is there a way of storing data um, on your uh, personal servers that are then accessible through the system, right? And the way to do that would be to install the, the storage server component on your private infrastructure. And then create just a single certificate with which you can access that storage server and, and add that certificate to your profile to your encrypted profile on the authentication server. Then the software would contact that storage server of yours to store data on it. Okay. And, uh, is, there, is there a way to have uh, multiple users uh, that share an account? Uh, like for uh, association, for example, where there's uh, multiple users on, on the one um, Yes. Um, but in this case, if you want to share an account, you're sharing a public-private key pair. And what you're ultimately um, losing is um, the knowledge of who actually stored something there. It'll just be that single identity. But that's possible. We, we distribute the private key over different devices using different um, one-time pads. Uh, you could also spread it to different users using different one-time pads so that every user can have access of that key. Um, but again, that's like it saves you some time to to store all the encryption information because you have to store l fewer keys that have been encrypted. Um, but um, it compromises security a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, and thanks for your advice. Thank you.